Hello, everybody. Welcome to Semantic Kernel Community Office Hours, public community office hours. Always have to say that uh, because it's a public forum. But as such, right, we welcome you all to ask your questions, raise your hand, um, you know, add things into the chat. You know, we're more than happy to, uh, you know, take anything that comes from the audience. Uh, but we actually have a quite a packed agenda because we have several uh, questions that we didn't get to last week uh, that we have uh, on the docket today in terms of announcements. So we actually have some uh, new things, new videos that are out there. Um, so from last week's uh, great discussion during office hours, we uh, got to see a new walkthrough of chat copilot, a more like kind of in-depth example. And then there are also just like really good questions and discussion around uh, plugins, exception handling, uh, native semantic functions, all that. So if you missed last week's session, I definitely encourage you all to, to check that out. Um, and the newest thing that just dropped was uh, for many of you, you've asked for uh, more examples or tutorials of how to use semantic kernel and prompt flow. So we have a, a new video from Matthew Balanos. Um, he uh, created this nice, uh, more long uh, or a longer length uh, tutorial around how to use these two frameworks. And uh, it's really good. Check it out. Um, give us feedback. Uh, one thing to call out. So I know there's a big audience or people have asked about TypeScript version of the semantic kernel. Uh, while we won't have a TypeScript official version right now, um, we may have it in the future or th that might come from the community. Uh, that hasn't stopped some people, uh, uh, especially people who Microsoft just recently had a big hackathon, so this was the, the outcome of that, or at least one of the, the projects that came out of that. So if you want to see an example of how to dynamically load the .NET version of the semantic kernel into a TypeScript application, uh, definitely check this example out. Cool. Uh, OK, so next thing is, so for those of you in the Bay Area or who are attending this event um, happening in, in San Francisco, uh, I'm going to be actually be speaking at this uh, AI conference. Uh, so if you're there, you know, feel free to come by, say hi. Uh, happy to c connect with you all. Um, my topic will be just kind of giving some high-level examples of of how to build these sort of things that you all are building, right? Chatbots, agents, and all the different applications. So come through if you can. Uh, one more thing, actually, is uh, we have this uh, hackathon um, that uh, we're going to be co-sponsoring with Royal Bank of Canada. Uh, in Florida, uh, Central Florida. So that's ha this is happening in October. Um, and yeah, it's I guess it's more geared towards university uh, students, but I don't know what how many, but who the who can just show up. But if you're interested, right, for especially for people watching the recording, if you're a student uh, and you're in the region or you want to travel to the region, definitely uh, come out to this. Um, Cool. All right. So with that, uh, I'm going to hand it off to Garrett to give a demo. Actually, oh shoot, I realized I didn't put all the slides in uh, from my side. Give me, Garrett, do you have those images or slides that you could quickly rock through? Um, I don't have them to share on me at the moment. Um, okay, I'm gonna... just the first slide's fine. Yeah, I'll 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 paste it in, in the background. Okay. But go ahead, go ahead there. Yeah. So this is our salesperson copilot uh, for our company. Um, it's our our newest uh, product we just launched. Um, it enables uh, salespeople and business development people. Um, to quickly write emails without needing to go through the process of actually writing them out. Uh, you can see the buttons on the left hand side. Those are kind of pre canned responses uh, where whenever you click on, on the button, um, you enter in a stock number for the uh, for the boat that the customer is interested in. And then um, you click generate and chat GPT generates the email for you. And then you have the uh, ask feature down at the bottom, the little text box um, where you can uh, customize the email to your needs. Um, say the email um, is inviting the customer to a uh, to, 
to look at a boat, you can say um, include that they can look at the boat at this specific event. Um, and that event will uh, show up in the email. Uh, what this screen here is showing is various uh, questions that you can ask based on the data that we have on the customer. So what is their engagement like? And it comes back and says that Sally Ride has had this many emails, meetings, and calls. Um, you can ask what the customer's lifetime value is, and it comes back and says, you know, this is a platinum tier, dear customer. Um, and then on the next slide here, yep. So you can also um, generate emails without using the buttons and just say, you know, here's a specific uh, event or specific boat that I, I want to write this email about. Um, and then that is going to uh, generate the, the email response with all the data that we have on the customer um, and inject that into the email for them. Um, and then again, you can customize the email whatever, whatever way you want. You know, this one says, dear, maybe you want it to be more personable. So you say, uh, say hi instead of dear and remove last names uh, from the email. It comes back and it, you have a, a much more personable email there. Uh, that's what a lot of our users are, are doing right now. Um, they, they actually are using the buttons on the left hand side um, to generate the email. And then they're asking questions of ChatGPT uh, or giving instructions to ChatGPT uh, to say, you know, here's here's how I, I would like you to better format that email for me. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's basically it. The it's been going well so far. Um, had a lot of really good feedback that this is saving a lot of time across a lot of uh, use cases for people. Um, some people want want their uh, generate quote email uh, to be handled for them so they don't have to look up information in the system for, you know, how much is a boat or wh what location is the boat at. Um, a lot of people like the follow up e email so that they, they don't have to write that follow up email that, that says, you know, hey, just following up on, on your interest. Um, are you still interested in this boat? You just click the button, you get a nice um, company specific and company approved email um, that you can then hit the little copy button at the bottom of the uh, the chat bubble and just copy that right into the CR. Oh, you muted yourself, Garrett. Oh, I don't know how I did that. Uh, but yeah, this this lives inside of our uh, our CRM. Uh, so users can just hit the copy button, close the window, and email the customer directly. It uh, saves a lot of time. Very cool. That's what I got. Yeah, thank you for sharing it. I guess any feedback, any comments from the community, any questions you want to ask Garrett in terms of how he did this? I have a yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, Garrett. Uh, hey, great work. Um, can you walk through a little bit on, um, I guess, you know, the architecture as it relates to Semantic Kernel, like the like any plugins you developed, where they just, you know, semantic functions or native, uh, any of the, I guess, pain points that you might have come across? Uh, yeah. So the using native functions, what I'm doing is I'm calling an endpoint um, that was developed by uh, another member of, of my team. Um, I'm calling that that endpoint and just injecting the JSON into the prompt. Um, and the pain point has been um, really telling everybody down the line all the way down to the database side, like, you know, because I'm not doing any any transformations in the uh, application, I'm just injecting the the JSON response. Um, all of the field names need to be human readable. Um, they the LLM understands what humans understand. So if you abbreviate things to, to you know, heck and back, um, it gets confused. Um, so really the, the big part has been making sure that the field names line up, 
and that uh, um, really the JSON is formatted nicely for the LLM to read. Cool, I see some comments uh, or discussion in the chat. John's asking about any nice chat UI components in Blazor. And then Sebastian, I think you had an answer. Do you want to just come off mute to just share? Or if not, <laughs> Sebastian says, we built a lot no, with no, Blazor. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, uh, just to share it with the, the people watching later. Uh, so yeah, Sebastian says, built a lot with Mudblazer. The timeline component is is great or isn't great. Um, but Mudblazer is currently not thinking about implementing Material 3, which says it's a bummer. So anyway, very good. Yeah, uh, and this is, is using Rad, uh, Rads and Blazor. Um, it's a, a Blazor app. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you, Gary, for sharing. And no problem. Yeah. If anyone else wants to show off demos, uh, I'll make sure to prepare it uh, better next time. But um, yeah, feel free to just reach out. We could do it in a future office hours. Cool. With that, I will go to questions. All right. So Glenn asks. Uh, so analyzing and summarizing sizable quantities of regular changing relational data using semantic kernel and AI models. OK, so many examples I've seen in the space center on preloading large quantities of static text into a vector database, then running a semantic search on the vector database first to provide context for AI model calls. My use case is more dynamic as the contextual data needs to be queried at runtime from a relational database, then processed through AI models to provide a mathematically accurate analysis and summation. There's not really a question there, but I'm guessing it's how do I use semantic kernel for this more dynamic sort of use case? So and we actually have Chris here um, who's worked um, a bit on this in this area. So Chris, do you want to maybe add some commentary to this? Sure. I was just looking at Glenn online as he, he joined us. Probably not. Okay. The um, So, I mean, of course, whether it's structured tabular data or unstructured textual data, um, a sizable quantity thing is always a challenge in terms of you have to deal with the chunking limits. Um, so I think the problem domain is similar there. Um, for um, uh, you know, I think one approach that's commonly used uh, to manipulate uh, tabular data is like using like data frames, um, some types of uh, like pandas, for instance, uh, the uh, where the data manipulation uh, can occur outside of the prompt frame and then selectively uh, pieces of it kind of uh, processed by the prompt. But uh, the uh, where I'm going with this is uh, one thing that we uh, might be looking at here soon, hopefully, is uh, Databricks. And Azure has some aggregation services, specifically Databricks and potentially Azure Cognitive Services that can aggregate these things and uh, specifically targets AI scenarios. So sometimes some of these added value services, um, aggregator services can be um, ideal for this as opposed to um, trying to you know, come up with a, you know, create your own algorithm and processing. Um. Yeah, no, that's good. I, I like this idea of, you know, you could use some of the other, you know, more commonly used tools like pandas, uh, for example, to help solve some of these challenges. And then after you process it in a framework like pandas, you can maybe then pass it to the the LLM as opposed to having the the AI do all that work. Um, maybe that might change as these models get better, but I think maybe for now, you mixing it with other tools seems seems the way to go. Yeah, I mean, especially I mean, in terms of if you don't want to 
re-import it, which of course is probably going to be a given for any substantial database that's dynamic. Um, but another thing just to throw out is the semantic memory service that is very new is something that the team is spending time in. And part of the long term vision for that architecture will be supporting some of these scenarios, um, but it's not ready for that as of today. Yeah, so Glenn, if you're going to be watching this recording later or anyone else, uh, send these scenarios over to that repo, the semantic memory repo. I'm sure the team will love to to have those. If I may, uh, just shortly, um, I, I was thinking about such an approach too, and um, on the, um, I mean that that's not actually related to semantic kernel, but on Langchain, there is an option that you can have the model query either your uh, O data endpoints or your graph endpoints. So you could expose your database uh, either via O data or via graph and have the model query it via functions. So that would be another approach to get that your dynamic data um, into the model. Uh, what you could also do is generate SQL from the model and then run that, but uh, I mean, we have uh, <laughs> we have prompt injection attacks, and then we have prompt injection attacks into SQL injection. That that would be hard. So <laughs> maybe not not go that way. <laughs> yeah, no, good ideas, but good challenges as well. Uh, John puts in the chat. One of the problems I run into with semantic memory is that the recall function does not all allow us to easily declare which memory collection to use. Different skills often need to pull from different memories. Yeah, I think that's that's fair to say. Um, yeah, I think it's on a per collection basis right now. But again, good feedback. We can incorporate that and in, pass that back to the team. OK, uh, many questions. So next one from JK. I think JK is on the call. So. So we have built several Azure bots, Google Dia Dialog Flow bots, and ChatGPT bots. I want to see how we can transform them into semantic kernel. Interested in a MVP for checking calendar and booking, uh, an email flow, gathering information from one to three web APIs, showing what is going to be sent and to whom, sending the email, using various knowledge bases to answer a question, and then combining these things. So how can I create a SK app that we can use <laughs> with the minimum work and cost? Yeah, I think that, that captures the question. So great question. I guess that, does anyone, maybe Desmond, Desmond's on the call. Do you have any commentary to add on this? Because um, I know you've been working a little bit on building bots. Yeah, I have been. I've been working with bot framework and we were mostly focusing on how can we show this in teams, but the same idea, um, you know, kind of applies for for email as well. Um, and I think taking a look at chat copilot um, and how that app has been built can, I think, give you a good idea as to how you can build um, an app that you know, consumes SK and maybe doesn't have all the, you know, features and sugar that Chat Copilot has, but at a basic level, you know, build an app that is um, utilizing SK to get the responses. And in the POC that I was doing with Bot Framework, I took the Chat Copilot backend and deployed that into Azure and then used that to, you know, drive the responses of the Bot Framework bot. Um, I think a similar thing like that can be done for an email flow as well. Bot Framework does allow for, you know, exposing bots in the email, and maybe you, got, you all have already taken a look into that. Um, but yeah, I think looking at Chat Copilot is definitely a good place to start in terms of, you know, how the app can be built um, to consume SK and, uh, you know, allow folks to build on that as well. And we have folks starting to do that. Um, throughout the community. Um, and then from there, you know, looking to see how can that be integrated with bot framework, specifically in using the web API to drive the responses of the bot. Uh, Jake, JK, yeah. if you're, if you're here, I think you are, how, how's that? 
any other questions or feedback you want to ask? If not, some questions from the chat come about. Uh, so Michael's asking, are there any plans for a Python chat copilot demo? Um, so right now from our team, probably not, at least not in the short term, just because many other things the team is swamped to, to do. But you know, we'd love to, if the community is super interested in it, to if you want to take that on, go for it. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think the the back end for sure can be can be anything. You, you don't have to use those, the same back end that um, the SK team is doing. So cool. Well, hopefully, uh, JK, that's that was good enough. If if anyone else you know on the call has any experiences doing doing this type of stuff or has started to tinker with building these type of bots with SK. Uh, feel free to raise your hand. Otherwise, we'll go to the next question. So Carlos asks, what is the easiest way to show to the user what documents have been considered to build their answer? It would be nice if they show up like tags as part of the answer. OK, so uh, the citations piece, which um, if, if Tower on on the call, I think you'd be able to speak more to this because I think we showed this actually. If you rewind back maybe two office hours ago, um, how kind of give gave this demo of using the citations feature from semantic memory, I believe, inside Chat Copilot. Is that right, Chris? You nod in your head. Um, yeah, he did. He he. Um, that was his one of his many contributions to uh, that project. Yeah. I guess maybe do you, can you speak a little bit of how does that work? How does that work behind the scenes? Yeah, well, I mean, even in the pre-semantic version, uh, semantic memory version of in the, in the current version of main of Chat Copilot, um, the uh, if if you look at the uh, in the bot response, there's an icon in the upper right corner, and if you click on that, you can see the prompt that's used to generate the response. There's two tabs, kind of a formatted version and then the raw version. And so in the prompt, you can always see, oh, the document snippets that were explicitly used, they were just never really surfaced as part of the UI. Um, and um, so even without semantic memory, we could have done some UX work to, to do that. It just becomes um, because of the data structures returned by semantic memory, um, it just became a lot easier. And since we were doing the change anyway, it was a good opportunity to build in that feature. Um, but basically uh, the main approach is uh, Along with the embedding, you uh, store some metadata with your schema that includes like the file name, and um, then um, so and then you retrieve the snippet. The metadata um, comes along with that, and then you uh, can format that in the UX as appropriate. Yeah, I think this is done through. Um... Some of the other popular chatbots, I forget if Bing Chat rolled this out. Um, I believe so. Um, but yeah, citations super important. It adds trust to the to the experience, right? Because like, oh, where did the AI get this answer from? Well, if you can mm -hmm. point to point to the, the the document, point to the snippet, I think that gives a bit more confidence that it didn't hallucinate the answer. Absolutely. Uh, one note in chat copilot. Sorry, just I apologize for that. No the uh, uh, how they also added the thing where there's the inline note to the citation, and uh, that actually occurs in the UX in the app during rendering. Interestingly enough, um, so it's that so inserting that note in the snippet is all client side, very dynamic. Yeah, and I was just going to say, I think it could be helpful for Carlos to take a look at that PR that we have open right now in Chat Copilot. I think it's going to merge actually today that yep, yep. incorporates this feature. And I think that'll kind of show the end to end flow of how we implemented this and at least provide a good starting place for, you know, how someone else may be able to do it in their chat app. 
Desmond, could you drop the PR in the chat? Absolutely. Great. Carlos, hopefully that's helpful. All right, uh, John H. John H. has two questions actually. So, uh, yes, there was a mention in a previous office hours about using a static plan to avoid a round trip to the LLM every time. Could we see some more examples of how to actually achieve this, assuming it's not just a case of deserializing a plan from JSON and attempting to run it? So, uh, I think more or less, you know, when you generate a plan. Right. Yes, you can choose to serialize it, write it out, um, and then reload it back in to the to the kernel. Uh, so <laughs> I don't want to say it's like uh, this is exactly what you wrote down, but I feel like it's more or less what you're describing, John. Um, yeah, that was actually me on the call. Um, the only thing that I've noticed when actually trying to do that is when you reload the plan from JSON and then run it. All it does is return your input. It doesn't actually seem to execute the steps that are part of the plan. You just get your question fired straight back at you. Oh, that, then that sounds like a bug. So, so I assumed sure. I was doing something wrong. <laughs> Could you inspect the plan? Like, does it show you the, the steps of the Yeah, the, the, the plan function. was fine. The parameters and outputs were all as expected. It was just when actually running it, it just seemed to just return the original plan again. And I noticed that there's some methods on the kernel, such as uh, import plan from JSON and things like that, which I think are still not supported yet. So I didn't know whether that was just a, a up and coming feature. Yeah, that might be a bug then. Uh, if, if you haven't already, could you file an issue um, on GitHub? Yeah, Our team can we'll do take that. a look. Great, thank you. OK, so you have another question that has a comment actually attached to it. So you about planners. So is it possible to use a stepwise plan to generate an answer to a query, but to then save the steps that established during its trial and error phase as a sequential plan for that particular type of query in the future? Um, so Lee Miller, right? he's the, the architect for stepwise planner for sure, and, uh, and planners in general for a semantic kernel. Um, he says, we definitely have been tossing this idea around. <laughs> We'd love to see it happen. So I guess short answer is maybe not possible right now, unless you do a lot of your own engineering to to, to do that. Um, yeah. yeah, but okay. no worries. could be very promising of a direction. But no, thank you for bringing it up. Okay. So uh, Juanma asks, I wonder if we can cover the import plans feature. I know there's an open PR to solve a bug I've been dealing with link here. I tried this feature, whoops. I tried this feature with the only plan class constructor that seems to be working, but the plan doesn't seem to be available during runtime inside the planner kernel. I set up the goal manually with the description attribute and tried to follow this integration test. So some questions. Is it possible to use the SK import plan feature with current open issue? Can we see during runtime if a plan is successfully imported inside the planner kernel? And which type of plan is better to use with imported plans? So I, I clicked on this. Looks like it's merged in last week. So let me just go back to the question. Have other people run into this bug and has has it been resolved? <laughs> oh, it's the link. Uh, it's just the plan. Importing the plan. That sounds kind of um, related to my questions, really, in the the importing side of things isn't quite working correctly at the moment. OK, yeah, then it does sound similar. So uh, Juanma, if you're listening to this later, uh, yeah, I guess we have to investigate some more. If, it, if it's still not working, importing plans, then we'll have to go back to the team to look. 
but thank you for bringing it up. Uh, cool. All right, next question is from Michael. So Michael asks, I'm struggling to understand how to properly leverage RAG, the retrieval augmented generation pattern, using semantic kernel and Azure Cognitive Search. I have existing indices, which I would like to point to, but I can't, as the SK seems to only accept, accept a hard-coded schema. What is the correct design pattern to use existing ACS indexes with SK? Chris, do you have a context about this one? Yeah, you know, funny, this also just came up yesterday uh, in a team chat where uh, I think Nilesh was asking about, um, you know, we kind of hard code the schema field for embeddings. So if somebody has an index, for instance, where uh, so some vector databases, so like an ACS, for instance, you can name the embeddings field anything you want. So somebody has an index with an embeddings field, you know, that can't be consumed by SK. So there's a disconnect there that should be more flexible. And um, the so right now, yes, the semantic kernel schema is static and fixed. Um, that's recently come under scrutiny. Also in the semantic memory project, um, this there's the scheme has been expanded a little bit. Um, and I think Dev has some plans to make it more flexible. Um, so I know that um, sch schema dyna dyna dynamism um, is something that's on Devis's radar for semantic memory for sure. Yeah, and Devis is currently on vacation right now. Uh, well deserved yeah. vacation, but he, so <laughs> we'll, but we'll make sure to bring up these uh, issues back uh, to him when he comes back. But yes, thank you for bringing up Michael. OK, so next question. So Brad asks, how to connect SK with an existing index? We talked about it. What's the best way to keep an Azure deployment updated with the latest SK updates? GitHub, is it possible to use Teams app as a front end to SK Copilot? OK, three different questions. Uh, number one, I mean, Chris already kind of talked about it, but he points to a few links about yeah, the Azure Cognitive Search and the semantic memory. Uh, we, we've been talking about semantic memory, but maybe some people here don't know. So I'll just open it here, drop it in the chat. But it is this other repo. Kind of think of it like a companion repo to semantic kernel. And it gives a opinionated way to sort of uh, add memory to your uh, SK applications. So you can check it out, um, see how to use it. Um, and then for number two, so what's the best way to keep an Azure deployment updated with the latest SK updates? GitHub. So Desmond, I see you put answer here. Rather than read it, do you want to just come off mute and describe? Yeah. Um, so we kind of have the same challenge in our repo where we're you know constantly updating to the latest SK. And if there are breaking changes, we need to go and you know fix those manually. But like if assuming there are no breaking changes, um, I think this should be able to be accomplished with like the combination of like dependabot, right? So like just to keep the package fresh and up to date um, on you know whatever uh, kind of cadence you desire. And then having that you know up to date repo uh, you know with that latest package be deployed to Azure um, with like a you know GitHub action like a GitHub workflow. Um, and there are a ton out there that can do that. Um, so if I'm understanding the question correctly, I think that that, that should be um, kind of the method that you'd want to use to, you know, keep your um, latest bits fresh with the latest SK. Um, but yeah, feel free to reach out if you kind of have more questions about that. Yeah, if anyone on the call has other best practices or experiences to keep a rapidly evolving project, right? I guess up to date in your own apps, let us know. Love to hear. Uh, okay, so for number three about Teams uh, as a front end. So yes, Desmond already 
called out that he's working on this POC using bot framework, which for those who don't know, I'll just click on this link. Um, yeah, it's so SDK uh, that actually hooks up to many different sources that is showing off here. Yeah, like Messenger, uh, Skype, Slack, WhatsApp, all that. So if you're building a bot or something right on top of one of these platforms, uh, bot framework could be a good choice. And then yes, Desmond will show off. I think we'll, we're going to try to get a demo with him later uh, when he's ready, but uh, we'll show off how to use Symmetric Kernel with this framework. So yeah. stay tuned for that. Yeah, we'll have a um, demo for that, hopefully a video to, to kind of showcase that functionality. But at a basic level, you can have a you know bot framework bot that calls into a deployed chat copilot web API to get the response that the bot is looking for. And that won't be too many lines of code um, and could get you up and running with a bot in Teams or Slack, um, Facebook pretty quickly. Cool, looking forward to that. All right, uh, Rupert asks about product roadmap, case studies, demos, examples, or for example, when is the embedding model coming to Australia? Uh, so I don't know about this latter part. Um, I actually didn't know if that the embed. I'm, I, I'm when embedding model. I'm guessing it's about like the ADA model from Azure or from OpenAI and hence Azure OpenAI. Uh, I didn't know if that's not available in Australia. So if anyone on the call uh, knows any details about that, please share. But I guess stay tuned. In terms of product roadmap, um, so we released a while ago. Um, let's see if we can just easily pull it up. So a fall roadmap on our blog, which more or less, oh, here you go. You know, it takes us until like yeah, into the into the fall, probably end of the year. Um, but it really boils down to and you can see on the shirts, plugins, planners, and personas. Um, but you can see what some of that means, right? End-to-end uh, -end telemetry, uh, you know, more support for things like streaming. Um, so, you know, the, that's what we're focusing on. I think very practically, we're also I mentioned this in office hours before that we're marching towards this 1.0 release, which should be coming from what I hear in the next uh, few weeks or a couple weeks. Uh, so, yeah, stay tuned for that. So that's why the team is kind of uh, focusing on that. Um, maybe not bringing net new features into the kernel, but really just making sure everything's robust and ready to to turn to 1.0. So yeah, uh, take a look at that. Case studies, I've, I've received this type of question a lot. Um, outside of the examples that we publish, either on our blog or, or unit forms like this. Um, yeah, I, I think it would be great to have, you know, specific customers show off like, oh, this is what I'm doing uh, with with SK uh, to get some like logo confidence. Let's just call it that. Um, we, we have those, we just can't, or we haven't been able to publish them as of or yet. So that's one of those things. Stay tuned. We'll, we'll, we'll for sure have more um, coming in a bit. So. But yes, thanks for asking this, Rupert. All right, uh, so Isaac, uh, if Isaac was here, I'd ask him because it sounds like he has a demo to show off. Um, so Isaac, if you're watching this later, reach out to me. We're happy to show off your demo. Uh, but you said you created an implementation of a semantic search engine, chatbot engine, embedded page chatbots. So I'm looking to get this implementation advice on switching this to using SK and having a guiding framework rather than reinventing the wheel. So yes, as Debsman mentioned, Chat Copilot uh, is the way to go in terms of our reference sample. Uh, and this shows, this particular one shows the web API service, the backend. Um, so yeah, Isaac, hopefully you can just take a look at that, get some inspiration and then yeah, send questions over to the team uh, file GitHub issues. We can uh, see how we can work together to to build something. All right, 
more questions. 15 minutes. Uh, see if we can get through them all. All right, so Manny asks, uh, hello team, I was going through the Azure function calling documentation. I was wondering if SK is planning to add this as a feature. If so, is there an ETA for this? Okay, so function calling, talked about this multiple times. Actually, I have, I believe, the PR somewhere. Where did it? Wait, function calling, yes, from Gina. Uh, so uh, I know it's a long time coming. Thank you for everyone for being patient on this. Uh, I heard today that the team has kind of finalize on a an, an implementation of this and we'll look to get it merged in. So for everyone who's following, just uh, keep an eye out for this. Uh, thankfully, right, you don't have to, if you're a Python user, you don't have to wait too long because we have um, uh, Edward uh, who's taking ch charge to make sure to have this same thing, same experience uh, inside Python. So. I'll drop it in the chat for anyone interested who's following. Um, but yeah, function calling coming soon. OK, so Sebastian. Uh, Sebastian asks uh, a few questions, <laughs> but the, this first one. Uh, how would I use OpenAI Whisper speech to text model in SK? Create a Slack bot that can also answer voice messages. So. Desmond, do you want to come off me quickly to share about? This? Yes. Um, so yeah, as, as I was saying in the comment, you can use Azure Speech to integrate uh, speech to text in your bot. And we actually have an example of this in Chat Copilot. Um, if you um, fill in the kind of settings in the back end to um, for your Azure Speech instance, instance. So yeah, this is the front end kind of showing how uh, the recognition is done. Um, so that can be used for speech to text. Um, and you know you can configure that with the model of your choosing. And then in terms of using the Slack bot, this comes back to bot framework, um, you know where you you know hook up your bot to um, you know call into the web API, and then you can produce those responses into Slack or whatever channel you you choose. Awesome. Sounds good. All. Sebastian's next question is, what would be the suggested or best way to hook into the indexing and retrieval documents into a semantic memory store? So the main idea would be to not index the actual content of the document, but to have a model transform the content, i.e. into questions about the content, because that's semantically nearer to the actual questions that user asks, and then store that the actual content in the document's metadata. And at retrieval, the model would need to work on the actual content and not the transformed index vectorized part. I mean, I think the embedding basically doing this inherently, kind of. I don't think we need the extra step. Is kind of my first read on that. Uh, I, we we really need it. I I tested that uh, on on a lot of um, data. Uh, we have a lot of documents that are very similar, and in in the large brain of a of a model and and the um, embeddings model these are the documents are very near together and so um, a question about a document or about a content is further away from the documents as all the other documents <laughs> so we get um, a relevance index of uh, 0.6, 0 0.7 or so when questioning. When we transform the document into questions about that document, we get uh, almost 0.9. So this is this is significantly better when we transform the content. But well, to to generate the final answer, we really need the the original content. So that's mm. um, yeah, <laughs> that's difficult. <laughs> that's really interesting to hear. I mean, I suppose you could link it with metadata somehow, just do some bookkeeping for the back, back pointer to the original. The um, yeah, I'd be really interested to uh, learn drill into the results you're describing. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I've also recently struggled with, I mean, getting a lot of compressed scores in the range that are really compressed around in the 70s. And um, so uh, the thing you're describing resonates with me as well. 
I'm currently writing a blog post about that. We'll share with you when it's online. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, feel free. If you want us to feature it on our dev blog, happy to, or feel free to just post it on yours. No problem. No, this is a good question. I, I think this idea of, uh, I, I, I would bucket this under the more sophisticated rag patterns that are, you know, people are discovering, people are trying to figure out uh, what works. So it's awesome to hear that, yeah, transforming the content as a pre-step could be helpful. Go ahead, yeah, can I can I just throw one point? Something just uh, what I discovered when I was looking at this is Azure Cognitive Search is kind of a hybrid vector data store sort of, and you know where some pure vector databases you're querying with an embedding you've generated. Azure Cognitive Search has an API where you can just pass in the string. You can either query with an embedding or you can just give it the string and let it deal with it. And interestingly. If you use that entry point for Azure Cognitive Search, um, whatever they're doing internally gives you a much stronger spread and a much more distinct signal for the documents. It's quite a bit different from what you're seeing on the uh, vector results. Um, just throw it out there. Interesting. Yeah, Michael put in the chat this link to this paper. Um, about yeah, about this problem, they propose this thing called hypothetic hypothetical document embeddings or hide. So yeah, very interesting. Uh, I'll definitely check it out. Thank you for sharing. Cool, good discussion and good question. Uh, and Michael, I don't know, say Michael, but <laughs> Michael asked this question about uh, so how to break out of a planner to ask the user for input. So you take this following flow of events where a user has a goal, there's some functions. So in the user goal, they've not specified with whom. So the user to be invited is missing. Okay. So it's like a the ask is not complete. So so he said, I've added a function uh, and the planner correctly identifies the param for this function or for this thing is missing. It needs to ask the user and execute that function. But the output is uh, for the ask the input function is passed to the send opponent function instead of the planner exiting at that point. So this is using stepwise planner. Very good question. Um, so I think this falls under the bucket of more dynamic planners uh, and being able to capture user input, especially when you know whatever ask, whatever goal that the user provides doesn't have all the information. Some of this comes in the form of uh, so many office hours ago. <laughs> uh, I think we had this discussion around if you're basically trying to do like form filling, right? And you're just trying to capture the right bits and pieces of it. Um, it might be more appropriate to maybe design a function or set of functions and just have that be a chain or flow. You know, you'll, you'll see these terms used, but basically it's just something like pre, predetermined that use like, hey, do this thing, fill this out, as opposed to having an open-ended planner kind of try to meander its way to, to try to figure out what to what to do. So, so that's one, I guess, thought around maybe, you know, if you're, it, it's really about like, okay, please arrange an appointment then you just redirect or the plan's job is to redirect to this flow that is more or less like a form filling thing um, is an idea. So I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts on this for Michael. Uh, or if Michael, actually you're, you're on the call. So if you have any other questions or th thoughts you want to no, share? Not yet. I think that makes sense, yeah. Um... Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Cool. All right, <laughs> one more question from Sebastian is regarding chat copilot and personas. So while I understand the idea behind having the model first extract the user's intent and the audience, then generate response, then as extract new memories from the context, these, there's quite, these are quite a few round trips to the model. 
which can make the bot slow and much more expensive. Are there any documents, papers, I evaluate how much better the behavior is with that approach? Uh, so that's easier to determine if it's worth the higher latency and cost. Yeah, asking the hard questions. I mean, I, I think this is very much emerging. Um, there probably are some papers out, so if anyone in the community knows of such, please send us send it to us and let us know. I mean, even right now in Chat Copilot, you know, it, there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes to to generate a, a response, to create the plan, execute the plan, etc. So, and yes, each one of those is at least one call, if not more, to a AI uh, API endpoint. Um, so yeah, it's, it's one of those things where you're in this world now where you're interfacing with a powerful AI tool, but that tool costs money to use each time. It's like a your 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 you know and tokens that you have to use to to expend. So yeah, I, I don't have the those that answer about the comparison. So if people do, please uh please share that out. But I think we'll, we will start seeing more of this uh, soon, maybe even from Microsoft. A good question. All right, interest of time, just try to wrap these up. So Peter asks, uh, I am a product owner with some development experience. I want to get our devs to use SK. Uh, the one thing is that they're not convinced about is that GPT isn't trained on our data. I can see that it's possible to do a vector search on stored memories and use those in a subsequent prompt, but that's not really the same as having GPT be aware of our internal data and be guided by that. Is there an easy way to do this using SK that I'm missing? And if so, is there any documentation or tutorials that you can share? Um, okay, yes. So Peter, this is a, I mean, thank you for asking this. Uh, we'd love to have your developers use Semantic Kernel. In terms of this question though, I think it's, uh, now, semantic kernel is not right now in the business of training models. Um, so that's a different conversation to have with you know, a different framework or a uh, different thing. There is this notion of fine tuning though, uh, but you know, that is more about steering the model to kind of you know, respond the way that you want it to look like in terms of the form and the fashion. Uh, but in terms of like training on your actual data so that yeah that it's able to just retrieve it without additional without introducing like the rag pattern like i think that's a different um different thing and it's maybe at least for now i think the guidance is it's cost prohibitive to go down that route um especially if you want to have a gpt quality model uh so I see. Uh, Chow, Chow, do you want to just quickly come off mute if you want to share your thoughts? Yeah, um, we have similar uh, scenarios. Uh, I mean, it's not train the model on your data, but we can provide our data source to SK, uh, to AI through SK. Then they can use your uh, your data and um, doing the AI thing on your on your own data, something like those. Yeah. It's yeah. also use ACS, but not not for memory though, but for the document. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, thanks for calling this example out. Yeah, hopefully, Peter, that's that's enough to <laughs> to give you some, you know, data points you could bring back to your team to see if they can use SK. But good, good question. All right, last one, just so we can wrap up. So Jesse asks, uh, or or it doesn't ask, it just brings up. Is you can I'm nearly finished in migrating the Uga Booga connector to a new repo and I started adding notebooks, a new repo. The next step is the multi connector publication. So for those interested, these are the links that Jesse provides. Semantic fleet. Not oh, very cool. Like this. Extending the capabilities of SK. Then there's a Duget package. And Mark says looking as looking at look at this pr because i guess there are things as we're moving to this 1.0 that a little in flux where is it this one 2829 yeah 
refactor to support generic LLM requesting. Uh, yeah, anyway, take a look at this because it probably affects your implementation. Because, yeah, Mark points out, change the approach to pass an AI request settings to a connector. But cool, Jesse, very, very, oh, you're on call. Do you, do you want to say anything very quickly? Yeah, well, I just wanted to make sure we can uh, kind of uh, uh, synchronize because uh, there is uh, an existing um, NuGet package for the Ubabuga connector. And I think it did add a bug where the end token wasn't counted for. So the, the, the model would go on uh, for as long as the token limit. Uh, which is a bit annoying. So the the new uh, NuGet package has got a fix for that, but it's got all what was in that PR that was closed, and uh, uh, so you'd need to change a little bit your code. Uh, but it's not a big change. It's just there's a new class for settings, and uh, I added documentation for that, and I started adding uh, notebooks. So hopefully, the, I'll manage to get the the new repo going. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And for anyone who wants to check this out, please uh, give Jesse feedback. All right, we are at time. Thank you all for staying a little later. And yes, thank you all for coming. See you next office hours. <laughs>